Would you please pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Are you ready for a miracle? Sorry, I still got the leap of faith thing in me from last Wednesday night when I subjected the Bible study people to it. Ready for a miracle. Let's talk about miracles. We love to talk about miracles here at House of Prayer, don't we? Big topic. We always talk about miracles. What? A miracle? A miracle? Don't worry. The people at Van Kirk thought the same thing. We Lutherans must all be on the same boat in that one. A miracle? What? You mean like a bunch of fishes turning into a whole bunch of fishes? Miracles. So I've been on the uh, Lutheran Campus Ministry Board down at Pitt for Pitt and Carnegie Mellon for a number of years now. And uh, the topic of miracles pops up there every once in a while, even though we don't ever talk about miracles around here. Every year, the National Board of Campus Ministry, or wherever it is, they give out a survey that has to be filled out about campus ministry in your context. And it's a big deal. Uh, They ask questions like, how many people show up for worship? How many come to your Bible studies? Then there's essay questions like, you know, describe what your worship is like. Um, Tell us about the context of your campus ministry. Is it rural? Is it urban? Describe. Um, But one of my favorite questions that they ask every year is, how many miracles have you performed in the last year? (laughs) It's always one of these confounding questions as we sit there and look at this question, like, how many miracles? And there's just so many ways of answering, like, one, none, a million, too many to write in this space. I mean, there's endless, because it just begs a bunch of questions that we Lutherans would ask. Questions like, well, we would probably say that no miracles have we performed because we don't perform miracles. God does miracles, and sometimes they happen through us, but we're not the performers of miracles. I'm not going to do any miracles today. A baptism happened at Van Kirk, but it wasn't my miraculous work. It was God's. Um, and so that would be the first thing we'd say about miracles. But the, the second thing is probably even the bigger question that probably all of us would wrestle with. And when I said, who's ready for a miracle, you're like, What? It's the question, what is a miracle? What does it look like to be in the presence of a miracle? Like, and if I asked you when they happened, you'd be like, I don't know. So what what would be your your answer? You can dialogue a little bit now. If I said, when was the last miracle you saw, what would you say? The birth of a baby, thank you. That's what the, the brothers and sisters of Van Kirk said too. They pointed to their little grandchildren and said, amen, yes. Birth of children. And then the joy of having children, like 50% of the time, is also a miracle. It's a thinking one. What else? What other miracles are in your lives? Oh, jeez, you guys. He- healing for being sick. Like if your wife had cancer and they did radiation for her all week long, that might be something that would be kind of miraculous. I'm very much with you on that one. Yeah. Yeah. The miracle of open heart surgery, let alone a complicated one where it's not a high expectation of making through it. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's a, that's a, a miracle for sure. Any others? Finding your life's love. Finding your life's love. <laughs> Man. Amen, we're just going to sit down after that one, right? <laughs> I saw it from here. You guys all face forward, but Carol actually wrote that on a note and passed it over to Fred. <laughs> I googled miracle because I wanted to see what the internet thought a miracle was, and the first thing that popped up was the movie Miracle. Miracle on Ice, 1980, uh, men's Olympic hockey team, the, all the amateurs played the big Russians, beat the Soviet Union in the semifinal game, and then beat Finland in the gold medal. That's a miracle, I guess. Then I, I, you have to look up in the dictionary, too, to find... Cause, and so in, in the dictionary, to find a miracle as an extremely outstanding or unusual event, thing, or accomplishment. So I think we have a sense for miracle. Let's look at the gospel that we just read from, uh, from John about a miracle. Because um, we would... A lot of us probably know this story about the fishes and loaves. It's told in all the gospels. A couple of the gospels even have it a couple times. And 
There's some variations in the story, but it's the same premise every time. Um, and in John's gospel here, it seems like Jesus is always running away from people, and they just will not let him go. They're kind of relentless to him. So finally they show up here, and the dialogue is funny. I like to read Jesus in a sarcastic sense, because I think he's sarcastic. And so he, see, he sees all the people coming, and he's like, hey, Philip, where do you think we're going to get all the food to feed these people? Ha, ha, ha. And Philip is like, oh, my goodness, I don't know where we, six months wages wouldn't feed all these people even just a little bit for them. And Jesus has to be like, Philip, dude, come on, man. Uh, and so then uh, Simon Peter, or one of the other disciples, says, well, here's this boy. He's got five loaves of bread and two fish. Um, and actually, it says barley loaves in John's gospel. Barley was like the grain of poor people. And so this is like extremely poor people food here too, the five barley loaves, representing just the poorness of the situation. And so Jesus decides that'll work. And uh, the language isn't quite as concrete in John's gospel, but the others, when they tell the story, it's even more concrete about what happens in this next moment. Jesus takes the bread, I'll um, abbreviate here, takes the bread, blesses it, and gives it to them. Sound familiar? Yeah, we'll get to that in a little bit, the Eucharist. I mean, very intentionally, all the gospel writers try to make that connection between this moment, the miraculousness of the Eucharist and this moment. Um, And so Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, gives it to everybody, they eat of it, and then there's no explanation about what happens. All that it says is this next line about, then um, they were satisfied, and Jesus tells the disciples, gather up the fragments so that nothing can be lost. And they gather them up, from the five barley loaves, and it filled 12 baskets. My snarky response is, yeah, the baskets were like those little pint, like little things you pick raspberries in. It was those, 12 of those, duh, yeah, no big problem. But that, I mean, clearly this is supposed to point to a miraculous moment. The baskets must have been huge. I think in the other gospels, it actually describes the baskets as overflowing, huge. Uh, This is supposed to be a huge moment. I mean, so, there's no explanation about how we go from five fish or five bre- loaves of bread and two fish to 12 baskets overflowing. And so we've always been taught this story to think, what happens? Jesus multiplies them. Isn't that how we've always been taught this story? Yeah. yeah. That's, it's, that's always been the act that Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, or one story at seven loaves, but took a small amount and made this huge amount to feed 5,000 people. And in a couple of the other stories, it just says 5,000 men, not to mention all the women and children, because who cares about the women and children? Just, just, I tease. Yeah, but the point is Jesus <laughs> multiplies this bread, this small amount that would fit right here, and feeds a huge gathering. It's about a magic act. Like, it should almost be something from Harry Potter, where he waves his magic wand, and boom, all this bread and loaves. And that may be how it happened. I don't know. I wasn't there 2,000 years ago, and none of us were. And the story doesn't go into details in any of the stories about what happened in that moment. But something miraculous happened. But let me suggest today that maybe the miracle wasn't what Jesus did, but it's what the people did. Who's been to a picnic or gone to a tailgate or something like that? Everybody? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, 35 of us just went to McConnell's Mill last weekend and we had a picnic. And I'm going to use that example because it was perfect. Last week we went to McConnell's Mill, a big group of our church, and I took some hot dogs and hamburgers. And as I watched the people getting there, um, someone came with some bags of chips. Another group of people came with a big cooler of water and drinks and uh, pitchers. Another person came with a big box of cookies. And there was a potato salad and the um, toppings for our burgers and hot dogs and um, by the time everybody got there and all the stuff they brought got there, we had a whole table just full of food. Have you been to those kind of picnics before? If you're a Lutheran, you have to say yes, because we call them potlucks. <laughs> it's like the heart of our community, potlucks. Yeah, where you go and you bring food to share with everybody else. 2,000 years ago, these people must have decided, 5,000 strong of them in the morning, that they were going to go follow Jesus darn it. And they did. There weren't restaurants to go to 2,000 years ago. You didn't go over to McDonald's and grab yourself a Happy Meal on your way to follow Jesus, or get some pizzas from Pizza Hut on your way to follow Jesus. Do you think that maybe these people did the same thing that we did last Saturday and Sunday, and every time we have a picnic where everybody just brought some food to share, 
or brought some food for their family, really. And then when they got there, 5,000 people strong, they sat down and Jesus started blessing and sharing food and they all started doing the same thing. Maybe the miracle isn't necessarily what Jesus does himself, but what Jesus does through 5,000 people, what Jesus does through everybody there, when they all pitch in and start caring for each other, when they start holding what they have in common and giving it to each other. That's powerful. I mean, so it's easy for us to be caught in the mindset that miracles are only these big, huge moments, like when my children are born, or when there's a baptism like there was at at Van Kirk this morning, um, that, that those are the only times that God does miraculous things. Like people avoiding terrible injuries in car accidents, you know, where the car is demolished and the person walks away without injury. Or amazing advances in medical technology, and we all have lots of those stories um, and experiences in our lives. But sometimes, maybe oftentimes, miracles happen and they don't look that big or huge or mind-blowing Miracles happen all the time because of the little things we do. I saw a miracle this week on ESPN. It involved Andrew McCutcheon. But it did not involve Andrew McCutcheon hitting a home run. Many of us would say that it's a miracle that Andrew McCutcheon came to the Pirates and the Pirates quit losing after 20 years. That was a miracle. But the miracle I saw had nothing to do with Andrew McCutcheon playing baseball. Did anybody see the My Wish thing of Andrew McCutcheon this week. It was awesome. Oh my goodness. So ESPN does these my wish things. It's kind of like the make a wish thing where they pair a child up with an athlete. Um, And so the first scene is is this kid, after telling his story, who had heart problems um, and wasn't even supposed to live through childbirth. And he's sitting in his living room in Maryland watching um, Andrew McCutcheon highlights from like 2012. He's like, this is when Andrew McCutcheon did this. All of a sudden, his iPad starts ringing and says, Andrew McCutcheon to accept call, hit here. And he does, and it's like, hey, buddy, how's it going? How are you doing? Why do, how would you like to come to PNC Park and hang out with me for a day? And, of course, the kid's like, mom did, because they're sitting on the couch across, look, it's Andrew McCutcheon. Um, and so he, he does, he goes, his family get up, they go to Pittsburgh, and the next scene is them at a restaurant outside of Pittsburgh, and they order their burgers, and guess who comes out to deliver their burgers to the table? It's Andrew McCutcheon, and he sits there with them and spends the, the lunchtime with them. Then they all get on a limo, and they go to PNC Park, and there's scenes of McCutcheon out in the field throwing catch with this kid. And then there's scenes of McCutcheon throwing up balls, and the kid's cranking them into the stands for someone else to pick up. And then the really cool moment, they go over to sit in these big plush chairs with an umbrella, and they play video games on the Jumbotron. <laughs> that would be Amazing. And then they go into the locker room because McCutcheon wants to introduce this little kid to all of his friends and teammates. He meets uh, A.J. Burnett and the whole team. There's some, uh, you know, Hurdle obviously does a great job of giving him some words of wisdom. He goes out and throws out the first pitch of the game that night. Closing scene, McCutcheon and this kid in front of his stall, in front of where his uniforms are. He says, you know, we got to have a a special handshake, just the two of us, no. He's like, what's it going to be? And the kid, without hesitation, goes over, puts his hand out to McCutcheon, and hugs him like that. It was, and McCutcheon's like, yeah, that's awesome. He gets up and runs around the locker room. Um, for all of his heroics on the baseball field, nothing was more heroic or more miraculous than him taking a day out of his life and spending it with that kid. It wasn't superhuman abilities to hit a baseball at 98 miles an hour. It wasn't the ability to catch a fly ball or run real fast. It was spending time with this kid. That was the miracle. Miracles happen like that. Like a friend of mine who I spent yesterday with who's going to spend this upcoming week with friends and family of hers that just lost their dad as she helps them go through their house and figure out which stuff they're keeping, which stuff they're not keeping. That is a miracle. A miracle was me and my family going over to Van Kirk Lutheran Church last month and having van- vacation Bible school with all of those people over there. That was a miracle for our family. A miracle is when someone asks how somebody else is doing and then actually wants to hear the answer and sit there while you hear that answer. A miracle is someone that actually has the audacity to speak out against injustice and violence and racism. 
A miracle is turning someone else's junk and bad attitude and bad whatever and returning it with empathy and joy and happiness. Let's be honest, too often we just sit around looking for the big thing and wondering where God is in between that, waiting for God to do like this amazing, miraculous thing, waiting for Jesus to make loaves and loaves and loaves of of bread and fish out of five and two. Maybe it's about us. It's never really about us, but maybe it's about God working through us. There's a, there's a saying that says, um, or someone prays for God to move a mountain. Meanwhile, they're sitting on a pile of shovels. Maybe you are the miracle for someone in your life. Maybe you are the one that can make a difference in the people around you. How about it? Amen.